people, I would like to welcome you all uh, to this. We are, are going to record this uh, session as well. Um, my colleague, Dr. Elena Tron, will basically do the presentation. Uh, we would like to keep it within an hour, if possible. Um, the, this presentation, I know everybody's busy and has, uh, has a busy schedule, so we'd like to, um, to, to uh, limit it to an hour, if possible. So um, for those of you who does not know Elena, she's uh, with SA Statbook. She's one of our geneticists uh, working with the uh, genetic evaluations in also uh, genomics. Um, and uh, so um, you, you can maybe sit back and enjoy it for a while, but uh, I think it's also important that we, uh, we do also then uh, join the discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, it's also okay for those of you who want to ask questions in Afrikaans. Um, we can we can also obviously do that, uh, but I think for the benefit of our overseas guests, uh, we can we will just uh, conduct the presentation in English and then maybe translate if if the need arises. So Elena, it's over to you. Uh, it's your uh, it's your webinar, um, and and we keen to listen to to your presentation. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I'm very glad that so many of you are here. Um, we are going to talk about the double muscling in the South African uh, beef cattle. So as an introduction, the selection goal of many specialized beef cattle breeds is to improve carcass quality. And producers and butchers do want higher meat yield and a smaller first quarter, while consumers want less fat in their meat and double muscle breeds provide this type of meat. Uh, but the problem with the double muscle breed is, breeds are that they're not suited to extensive farming. Uh, they have problems with difficult births, and lowered fertility and fitness traits. So uh, although double muscle calves have been born sporadically for many years, the frequency of the double uh, muscle calves have increased in recent years. The mode of in inheritance is recessive or partly recessive so that the carriers of the genes is not always easily identifiable. Uh, they have since uh, identified gene that cause double muscling and genetic testing is available so one can identify possible carriers and it is therefore uh, possible to manage uh, the birth of double muscle calves by eliminating carriers from the herd or at least to prevent or decrease the occurrence of double muscle calves in your herd. So um, it's also known that there are different variants of the genes that cause double muscling, and it's also expressed differently in breeds. So uh, that is a problem. And the purpose of this study was to see uh, which variants do we have in South Africa, or at least at the, in, of the breeds that uh, record with SA type book, and what's the effect on the production trait GEBVs. So the GEBVs is the genomic breeding values, and we use the genomic breeding values because it's already corrected for uh, things like the environment. Uh, you can just see what the gene genotype are doing in the different environments and the different breeds. So we also looked at the performance of normal versus carrier animals and to see what is the effect. So if you think about double muscling syndrome, the most important traits is uh, dystocia or difficult calf calvings. And this happens because birth weight is greatly increased in double muscled animals. And uh, so you have difficult calvings and uh, frequently the calf uh, dies. Apparently he is just so, the body size is just so big that the calf crushes the umbilicus in the, in the birth canal and, and just can't survive. So uh, the mature animals are overly muscled. So um, here's an animal with, which is normal and one with um, a lot of extra muscles, which is uh, how you know it's a double muscled animal. And then the carcass is also very important. 
So the caucus has a lot of uh, extra muscle, a larger eye muscle area, uh, if you measure it with RTU, but um, much less fat. And the less fat is one of the problems as well with double muscled animals, because um, the fat is important for the carcass itself to protect it against um, drying out. And the meat is tastier with more fat. Uh, and not only that, uh, an animal needs fat as a fat store, as an energy store when on under extensive uh, farming conditions. And it's also necessary for fertility and uh, adaptation. So the double muscling syndrome is caused by a mutation on the myostatin gene. So the myostatin gene produces the protein, which is also called myostatin, and uh, which means muscle, myo, and statin means to stop. So the myostatin protein stops muscle growth in young animals. And if you now have a defect of myostatin protein, uh, this causes the muscles to just keep on growing. But not only does it keep on growing, it, go, it grows to the detriment of other organs and um, fat and the bones in the, in the body. So you have some other problems as well. And you now have a very high lean meat content. You have lower fat and bone content. So you get a very high dressing percentage. Other problems with my double muscling is because of the lighter, smaller bones, you have difficulty of movie, movement. Uh, you now have an underdevelopment of the hip bone and smaller pelvic openings, and you have larger calves at birth. So um, dystocia and calf mortality is a reality. Um, this is a picture of the Belgian blue, which uh, has been selected in Europe for extra muscling and the calves are all born by cesarean section. Apparently you book your vet to come on, say Wednesday and take out all your calves. They are not born um, naturally. So they also have fertility issues. They're prone to respiratory diseases. Uh, the organs are smaller and less developed. So you have a smaller digestive tract, which reduces feed intake capacity. So um, they physically don't, uh, cannot eat a lot of, of uh, grass and they're incapable of efficient using of low quality feeds. So generally they're susceptible to the respiratory diseases, their lungs are smaller as, as well, lameness, nutritional stress, heat stress, dystocia. Uh, they're dysfunctional, they're regarded as dysfunctional in most environments, uh, they need uh, special care. If you want easy care cattle that you can just put out on the felt, um, the double muscled animals will not do well. Okay, so what causes it? So myostatin, as I said, is a protein that limits the muscle growth. This picture is apparently how it looks like. So uh, when the gene produces this um, protein uh, and there's a variant or a mutation, um, this protein looks different and it's either it doesn't work at all or it doesn't work as well, depending on what where in the process this mutation is. So uh, it causes the myostatin to be partially or completely inactive. And as a result, you have this double muscling syndrome, which basically is increased muscle growth and less fat bone and underdeveloped organs. So the myostatin gene uh, mutates reasonably uh, easily. So there's already been 20 variants of this myostatin gene identified, but only nine of them cause double muscling in animals. Uh, the ones that don't cause double muscling is there's some inactive parts in the gene. So the, the uh, mutation may, they, may be there or the mutation just doesn't cause the protein to be different. So nine of them, um, nine variants do cause double muscle. These uh, variants originated in different breeds and some are very breed specific and others are common across breeds. Um, some breeds have only one mutation, but there are many breeds that have more than one mutation. And sometimes you get animals as well that um, carry two different mutations. Um, 
So most of these variants are still not well researched or completely understood. And I think if we go on, you'll um, see why they say that. So here's a picture of the, uh, the gene. Let me see if I can get my laser pointer here. So this is the gene, schematic um, drawing of the gene. And these are the inactive parts. So you have what they call silent uh, variants which does not cause double muscling. So they might mark them in green. Um, there are many of them, but the lab that do our uh, genomic testing provide us with these four and another one of the silent uh, mutations. We still not really know what to do with them, but uh, we've got a student working on it and hopefully she will give us some light about that. So you have the silent ones, and then you have the detrimental uh, mutations which cause double muscling. Some of them are regarded as less detrimental, and they are indicated in blue. And in South Africa, we have this one, F94L. They say it's less detrimental because it causes less double muscling and apparently no carving difficulty. Uh, it's the one that's common in the limousine uh, breed. Then we have the detrimental um, mastatin variants, and they're called detrimental because they cause severe double muscling. And um, in South Africa, we so far found Q240X and NTA21. We haven't found these other ones um, in any of the animals that tested with us. So how uh, does it get inherited? Um, you will remember that you have two sets of chromosomes. One comes from the sire and one comes from the dam. So all your genes are, um, are double in the, in the animal. So if we have this is chromosome two, let's say, and there's your myostatin gene, and uh, this is a normal gene. So this animal phenotype is normal. Um, it's called a normal homozygote zygote as well. And it's also indicated by zero because it's got no uh, double muscling uh, variants. And on this side, we have an animal with two variants. So it gets the number two, it's a, called an affected homozygote. And it usually is double muscles, you can't miss it. This animal is double muscles. It's uh, mastitis, it's either not working at all, all not working very well. So especially in the detrimental um, ones, this will be definitely be a double muscled animal. The big question is what happens in the animal that has one normal uh, gene and one, um, one of the variants. So it's indicated by one, it's called a carrier or a heterozygote and the phenotype varies a lot, so, but that's usually the big question. What about this animal, this carrier animal, should you have him on your farm or not? And this is basically what we have been looking because um, this can vary between animals and breeds and uh, what's the situation in South Africa. Uh, as I said, it's generally uh, recessive, which means the uh, Heterozygote, these are heterozygote cows. They look normal and they have these double muscled calves. So they definitely are carriers of the double muscling gene. Um, this is an example of NTA21 and this is Q204X. It's the two uh, detrimental ones that we get in South Africa. And you can see that the very uh, thin bones, uh, frail bones of this calf, um, a, a lot of muscling the tail sits high and you have this the hind quarter sits higher than the than the front quarter so you have this um downward trend here uh, but not really much difference uh, between these two variants um here's some bulls that's also carrier and, and it's not uh, very double muscle so the gene action that you get in the heterozygotes is recessive so if gene action is recessive, it means the normal and the carrier is not uh, any different. They look the same, they perform the same, there's 
no way of knowing that the carrier is any different than the normal one. But as soon as the animal has um, two variants, you uh, get a double muscled animal. So the normal equals the carrier, but, um, and they are the same, but the double muscled animal is, is definitely uh, different, double muscles. Uh, remember these double muscling genes uh, affect different traits. So for some traits, there might be, it just doesn't have effect, normal carrier or double muscle zero, one or two, it's all the same. Then they have no effect. But if you the normal is the same as the carrier and different than the double muscle, it's what's called a recessive gene action. Sometimes it's partially dominant, so there's some effect in the carrier, or it can be intermediate between normal and double muscles. Partially dominant, you could also get with um, myostatin. And then the difficult one is the incomplete penetrance. It's called incomplete penetrance. And it means something there, but how exactly this gene action work is not really um, clear. Because you get that some animals or some breeds show effect, show a large effect, so show a small effect, and some are just not effect, affected at all. And they don't really know why this happens. Uh, the general idea is there's possibly an interaction with other genes in the breed or in the animal, um, or there's some or other environmental effect that uh, plays a role, which um, or we, both of them could play a role. And you could think about if, the, if you take good care of the animal and you really look well after it and you give it a special diet, then it's not so probably not so much affected than one um, that's out in the felt. So um, the environment and other genes also play a role. It's also important to, to know that breeder selection also plays a role. And this is also regarded as proof that there are other genes that uh, affect um, muscling as well. That myostatin is not the only gene affecting um, muscling. Uh, this is the Belgian blue breed in Europe and they just went and selected for terrible muscling. As you can see, these animals all have, have very, very much muscle. Uh, they carry the NT821 uh, muscle uh, variant. And um, if you look in the literature, they say, or NT821 is present in many breeds and not one other breed has this extreme uh, muscling that the Belgian blue has because in the Belgian blue, other genes were selected as well that cause the severe muscling. So this is an animal with NTA21. This is Q204X, and neither of them are so very extremely um, muscled than the Belgian blue. So if you look at the effect in the South African breeds, um, we have um, in the end worked with three breeds. Um, we wanted ones that had a genomic test for the myostatin gene. Um, as well as a genomic breeding value. So um, these are the breeds that um, do genomic testing and are um, selecting the animals on genomics. So um, this is a, um, and as a spin off, they get the myostatin test as well uh, with some other genes like the horn pole gene and the color genes as well. But so we looked at these breeds, genomic, genomic test for my statin gene and uh, genomic breeding values. So genomic breeding values are already corrected for environmental effects. So you won't have environmental effects in the, in the, uh, the comparisons. We did a statistic analysis and we looked at the significant uh, uh, differences between beans of genomic breeding values being normal and carrier, and we had a few double muscled animals that were um, genomically tested as well. Uh, there's not many of them because a double muscled animal, you can't really go on in your stud with it. So um, not many of them were tested, but we did have a few. So, but we mainly uh, looked at the comparison between uh, normal animals, zero variants and carriers with one variant. 
um, and significance between uh, between this is due to plain different means or variation around the, the mean. So six breeds had genomic tested uh, myostatin, and we found two of the detrimental variants, NTA21 and Q204X, and one of the less detrimental variants, F. 94L. So those are the three myostatin variants that we found. And a lot of the silent ones as well, but um, we're not using them at this stage. We're now just looking what's the effect of the variants that cause double muscling in animals. So F94L is also known as the limousine gene because it's common in the limousine. We found in five of the six breeds, but um, at very low numbers. We, it's literally one or two, three animals that uh, are in many of these breeds. So there's not really enough of them that we could look at the effect of F94L. So at this stage, we, um, we didn't look at that. We did compare the NTA21 and Q204X, which causes severe um, double muscling. NTA21 is the one that's found in the Belgian blue. And we found that in four of the six breeds, but um, only two breeds had sufficient numbers for further investigation. So we looked at two breeds with the NTA21. Q204X was originally found in the Charolais. It's known as the Charolais gene. Uh, gene. It's found in three of the six breeds, um, but we only had sufficient numbers in one breed. So we're looking at comparing two breeds for the Belgian blue and one for the Q204X. So there's the breed, one breed for Q204X and one and two breeds for NT281. So how the statistical uh, comparison works, you know that all um, distributions, we have the normal distribution. So the GBVs and the genes have these normal distribution. So um, this is the normal population. In this case, it's NTA21, one of the NTA21 uh, populations with weaning weight. So this is the normal population, um, had a weaning weight index of 105. The carrier population, the ones had a genetic, I uh, had a, a mean of 113, and the double muscled animals, the few that they were had a mean of 117. So you need to see which ones of these are significantly different. So you do a specific statistical uh, test. And this is if you draw the, the distribution. So you see here's your normal animals. And there's great variation, like you all know, for winning weight, um, different GEBVs. And, but if you look at the ones, the ones that are affected, the carrier animals, you see this distribution moves to moves up and you can see it on the mean as well. This one's average is 105, this one is 130. So this is statistical uh, difference between normal animals and carrier animals for weaning weight in this population. And you get good ones and bad ones in the uh, carriers and you get good ones, as you get good ones and bad ones in the um, normal ones. So here yeah, is a lot of scope for selection if you want to select, um, or if you have to select carriers or whatever. And here's all the few double muscled animals. They're very few. The mean is close to um, the ones and not significantly different. Uh, you can see it looks like that part of that one, but uh, numbers are not too great. So it's not significantly different from B. So here we have, we see the effect in this population uh, that the carriers tend to have a higher effect on weaning weight than heavier weaning weights. But with a lot of variation, they don't look, all look the same. So you can see in this population, the carriers are higher in weaning weight and lower on milk. It's a downward shift in the um, carrier population for milk. So this top specific population, both carrier and um, double muscles are regarded as the same or statistically the same, but different from um, the normal population for weaning weight, but for milk is the other way around. 
um, more negatively affected um, for milk than um, the normal population. So this is where it starts interesting. This is the other population that also carries the NT821 uh, variant. And you can see this is recessive. Remember recessive is normal and carrier is exactly the same. There's no difference. You can see these populations are on the same level. Where you get the double muscled animals, they tend to be uh, lower on weaning weight. So in this breed, there's not much difference between the carriers and the normal. So it's a recessive um, mode of inheritance, but you, you do get an effect there. And on the milk, there's no difference between either the normal, the carriers, or um, the double muscled animals. So all indicated by A. So that's A, A, B. So those are the same. This one's different. Milk is exactly the same. Uh, here's of the carcass traits. So um, here you can see the milk tends to have a larger eye muscle area um, on average than a normal population and less fat. So you can um, see the effect on these uh, much more measured animals. So you get a, get a much a uh, denser uh, growth here. Uh, do carriers look better? Is that maybe why they are they more easily get selected into for and why the gene has spread in the populations? And we have two herds that have scored the animals and afterwards uh, tested them to see who's normal and who's carrier. And the effect in the two herds were exactly the same. If you looked at those scored five and six, the normal carriers of the normal animals were more than the carriers, but that the high scoring animals, more carriers scored higher than the normal. So, um, and the same is here with males and females. The lower scores, the normal ones are more than the carriers. And um, in the higher scores, the carriers, more carriers got higher scores than the normal animals. But here are normal animals that scored high, so um, you can select for normal animals as well. Uh, but you probably need to test them to know who's normal and who's, um, who's carriers. In this specific breed, there were some animals that were over-muscled and they were cancelled. They, they didn't make it. So, um, it was all carriers that were overmuscled. So you do get our carriers that are overmuscled, and you get of some of them that scores five and six. So um, it's all uh, it's not easily seen on the normal animal or on the visual the muscling of the animal, but the carriers do um, look a little bit better because they score higher. Okay, instead of showing you now a lot of little um, values, um, I have summarized the effects in the different herds. So um, this is NT821 in breed A, and you get less fertile heifers if it's indicated like that. You, um, the normal and the carrier differ significantly, and the carrier is significantly less fertile for heifer fertility than normal animals and less the cows as well, cow fertility, less than in normal animals for um, this breed. There's no effect for NT821 in, in this one, which is typically um, this incomplete penetrance, um, what you would get. Q204X is a large population, uh, has also has an effect on fertility. Longevity is generally so shorter here. You have a recessive, meaning the carrier and the um, normal animal is the same, but the um, double muscled one has a shorter, um, all three of them have a, a shorter uh, longevity for double muscled animals and has effect on milk as well. Generally, the effects are the are the same, but they differ a bit between the 
between the breeds. The, the white in the growth tights is also interesting. This breed, they tend to be recessive. No visible uh, or measurement difference between um, normal and carrier. Um, in these two breeds, the um, carrier has a higher measurement. Here's some variety, some are recessive, but generally higher. And the problem is here, the higher birth weights of the carriers as well. So you have higher uh, birth weights and that could increase your risk of dystocia. Uh, the other thing that I found very interesting is the effect on the, the double muscling one. If you look at Q204X, you get an increase in the carrier, these are the traits on the x-axis, but the double muscling animals tend to be worse off than either the normal or the carriers. And one of the NTA2 breeds, is we found that is, uh, as well. So most of these are recessive. So normal and carrier the same, but double muscles is just out of, falls out of the bus. And this breed, it didn't happen. So these differences between breeds, the double muscled one performed even better. So if you want to, I guess if you want to breed a Belgian blue, you should you rather use this one than this one. But not that you want to do it, it's just besides the point. The carcass traits is the other important one. Um, eye muscle area picked up effect at, in all three breeds, um, none in the fat in the NTA21 breeds. These breeds do not have a lot of measurements on um, carcass measured with RTU. Um, so uh, at this stage, we don't pick up an effect. But it's not to say that if the, in, the measurements increase, that um, you might get an effect. Here you get the typical one, large eye muscle area, but less fat and less marbling. Uh, just quickly, the selection values. We saw this breed's mostly recessive, but its fertility is affected. So it's not good in general. Um, there's also, um, these two are not so different, heavier weaners. Um, which is maybe an advantage, but you have the heavier birth weights, less milk, increased maintenance, which means the cows are larger, and the fertility um, effect here, um, but none picked up here. So just to summarize, uh, NTA21 is different in the two breeds. This one, it's mostly recessive. Um, the Double muscled animals are significantly poor in performance. It's a, there's a detrimental effect on female fertility, shorter longevity, be, probably because of that. But the numbers are still relatively low. It might not be representative of all animals in the breed. Um, it's uh, mainly some herds, and it would most probably differ between herds. So breed B, uh, no effect on fertility, but negative effect on milk. Um, higher weights, including high, heavier birth weights, uh, which is also not good. Uh, the eye muscle area in the carcass was significantly higher, but we didn't pick up the effect on the fat. Q204X, um, a carrier, lower fertility, reduced milk, mostly increased weights and growth, which is good, but unfortunately also increases the birth weights, larger eye muscle area, and less fat. So if you want to manage it in your herd, um, you can do the genomic testing and it's done on hair samples. The hair roots, that's just these little bulbs at the hair uh, is where the DNA is extracted. And it can just be sent to um, ALSA in, a, uh, in an envelope for genomic testing. Uh, you now remember we have the normal which is indicated by zero. If you now see the results that you get, if you would test your animal with us, um, the normal is a zero, the one is a carrier, and a two is a double muscled animal. So we give um, to our breeders a genomic report, which has a lot of information, parentage, the pole gene is tested, coat color uh, genes are added, 
it's on the SNP chip that we test, so we give it back to our breeders as well. And then the double muscling. You see here are the detrimental ones, with the severe de uh, double muscling in red and the less um, severe in blue. And here are the silent ones. So generally your animals will have some silent ones here. You can just ignore it. These six we haven't found in South African breeds at all, so you can ignore them as well. Uh, the important ones to look at is these ones. So you will see this animal is zero for NTA21, but he carries Q204X. Um, so he's indicated as a carrier, then you must see which one he carries. So he carries X204X and not F94L. Um, this item, animal is clean or normal. He doesn't have any um, of the severe double muscling genes. This one is a carrier of NTA21, and this one is a carrier of F94L. If they were a double muscled animal here, you, you would have it too, where you would know it's double muscled. So, uh, to manage it, what to do with the matings? Um, if you mate a carrier with a carrier, uh, you can expect 25% normal calves, clean, no genes, 50% that's carrier again, and one 25% uh, chance for a double muscle calf. So you can mate a carrier and a carrier and you only have a 25% chance to see a double muscle calf, which is actually quite low. The problem is these carriers, um, you can see as an increase, there's only one that's uh, now rid of the gene. Um, and the problem with a double muscled calf is the calf is basically lost for breeding. You cannot use him as a breeding animal. Um, and um, you know, if you put a normal animal on a carrier, it doesn't matter which way uh, the sexes is, um, you will never ever get a double muscled calf. So the way to um, have no double muscle calves is to use one of the parents should be uh, normal, free from any of the variants. Should you do this with a, a normal bull, for example, on a carrier cow, you get 50% carriers and 50% uh, uh, of it is uh, normal animals. As you see how it can creep into um, a herd um, unknown. So uh, remember, if um, you have a double muscled calf, you can tick both the sire and the dam as carriers. You don't even need to test them. The only way you can get a double muscle calf is both parents are carriers. So that's what's going to happen. If both of the parents are normal, there's no way that you can get a carrier or a double muscle calf. So if you know the parents are normal, the calf will be normal as well. However, um, so you don't need to test them if you use them. Um, they might be, if you're selling the animal, the buyer might require a test or a normal animal would be um, probably worth more um, if to a person that uh, wants to get rid of the, of the carriers in his herd. So if a normal bull are used, no double muscle calves will be born, um, but you still have a 50% chance of a carrier calf. So it's not really gone here. If you have a carrier parent, you will get carrier coughs as well, the chance for carrier coughs. Um, but it is, you won't get any double muscle coughs. So uh, I think you strongly uh, uh, consider using normal pools on your heifers so that you reduce the risk of dystocia. Uh, heifers are more prone to dystocia, um, especially if they're still very young. And the double muscling calves, even in the carriers, sometimes um, or run the risk of being heavier due to the being a carrier, and that could increase the risk of dystocia. So rather ensure that you use a normal bull on your heifers. 
So how do you manage it? It's no need to go out and test your whole herd at once. That will be a very expensive uh, thing to do. You can start off with the bulls so that you know uh, which bulls are carriers and which ones are normal. That will be a good start to do. And then over the next few years, if you test only the heifers that you, are, that you retain in the herd. So you know uh, these heifers, which ones are carriers and which ones are normal. And as time goes by, you will know what your cow herd to. And as you know the status of all your cows, you only really need to carry uh, to, to test the cause of carrier appearance that you retain. Um, so over time, you can build up a nice um, record and know uh, which calves are possible um, carriers and which ones not, which ones need to be tested. But if, of course, if you're in the lucky position to be able to only retain normal uh, heifers, then in time, all your cows will be normal. And you, uh, if you only use a normal pool on them, you don't need to test anything. Um, probably only when you um, are selling an animal, but then you already know he will be normal. So um, it could increase his, uh, his value. So that's basically how you can manage the double muscling. Um, just before we uh, come to the end, so this is what happens. You had a herd of normal cows and you inadvertently had a carrier bull and now half of the, cal the calves are more or less are carriers. And then if you use a carrier bull again, do these calves on all your cows? inadvertently use a carrier bull again the second time, then you have a risk of double muscle calves being born. And you see here the very high in number of, of carriers as well. So uh, remember for each double muscle calf that's born in your herd, you more or less have four carrier cows. So um, because you only get it in a 25% chance of mating carrier on carrier to see that double muscle calf. So if the double muscle calf start coming along, you already have cows that are carriers. So um, yeah, you have a herd with half carriers and half normal. What would be the difference if you use a carrier bull on these ones? You get a double muscle calf and many carriers. But on the same herd of cows, you use a, a normal bull, you can see you immediately decrease your carriers in the calves um, a lot, and you have a higher proportion of normal ones. So um, carrier bulls uh, tend to increase the myostatin frequency in your herd, while normal bulls will decrease the myostatin uh, frequency over time. So in conclusion, uh, it's got incomplete penetrance in South Africa as well, definitely. I think we can expect that. So that means animals with the same variant are differently affected um, and other genes may play a role or the environment may play a role. But in general, both variants NTA21 and Q204X cause detrimental double muscle and it affects fertility and growth traits. And this could cause problems with adaptability, fertility, longevity, especially under extensive conditions. If you want easy care cattle, uh, this is not probably not the way to go. So, um, but it's also not possible to eliminate all carriers from the breeding herds in one generation. Some herds are, um, have many carriers, unfortunately. Uh, some herds uh, have, don't have a lot. Um, it will be easier for them if they want to get rid of it. If you have a lot of carriers, you need to um, manage it. Um, but you can uh, minimize the occurrence of double muscling uh, by testing animals and by using suitable mating practices. Thank you very much. So when it's uh, bulls concerned, then it's the женщина рассказывает. Uh, hello, uh, everybody. Thanks, uh, Elena, for this. Um, uh, I, I we can allow maybe a discussion and a few questions. Uh, Yusuf, maybe you have the uh, 
the chance now. Uh, uh, hopefully, you can still remember your question. So I'll, I'll give you the, the floor first. If you if you just make sure those that uh, want to ask a question to unmute yourself first, and then uh, you can uh, ask the question. So Yusuf, are you still there? Uh, if you are, uh, you're welcome to ask your question. Hi, Dr. Yapi. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity and uh, Elena for this uh, very fruitful, informative session. We really learned a lot. Uh, much appreciated. I would just like to know the following questions. In that is the first point is uh, with a specific herd, if I may, in the Higanuit breed in South Africa, how mm -hmm. many strains of double muscling are found? Um, I don't know if we must mention the breeds here. Will people not? Um, are you? Uh, I can answer the question if you, if you want it. But I think you have all three. Okay. Yes. Thanks for that. And uh, the other question is what I would like to ask is also double muscling. Mm. Yes, like we said, it has got a financial benefit to the consumer, the end producer, but it's also detrimental to the initial producer. And that is the farmer, which is us. Mm. Is there a way, like you've mentioned, um, I know there's no silver bullet to double muscling, because at the end of the day, we as farmers would like to get a better rand per kilogram for our carcass at the end of the day for mm -hmm. the breeders, commercial breeders that take our cattle. So in a sense, uh, pardon me, I'm a bit English African, so uh, and, um, uh, some of my words I'll say in Afrikaans. No, that's um, fine. And a matter is double bespiering eindelijk piggy goed and better for us for the end marker, because uh, what can happen is we can a better price and premium price for our flies that we can mark. Is that manier way we can balance or of teal to make sure that we have a of that can terughou or bestuur in our kids and to get a better financial advantage and you think to get um, yeah, you can do the for example, terminal pricings to do. Helena, uh, uh, um, yeah, Helena, yeah, maybe you can just also in English. I think just yeah, repeat. Okay. Yeah, there was a, a question: Is there a way that you can? Is there a benefit on the carcass side um, for this? Um, and uh, you know, how can one then uh, reap that benefit if there is is a benefit at all? Uh, you could maybe do terminal cross breeding where you have uh, cows that are not carriers, which are normal, and then you use a bull with uh, better carcass qualities on them, but you slaughter all the, the progeny um, to get the benefit of the, of the, uh, of the double muslin. But um, the problem is the cows- yeah, I, uh, Personally, I think, uh, Yusuf, uh, yeah, I, 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 personally, I think in a South African situation, you will probably don't get any benefit. Um, in, in Europe, uh, especially in Belgium, where you have a veal uh, market, um, it's a different story. Uh, 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 that's my opinion. But maybe one of the other uh, uh, breeders can also maybe um, come in on this. I'll be, I can not see if you or pick it first. So, pick it. Maybe can you can you first talk as you need yourself on it for the third time. Baie dankie, Jaapie. Ek, ek sê jou omgee as ek in Afrikaans praat. Ek wil net vir Helena baie dankie sê vir die presentatie. Uh, Al die goed wat sy gesê het is 100% wat hy op grondvlak ervaar. Uh, die, ek wil net vinnigs een paar opmerkings maak wat die kalvingsprobleme tref, tref. Moet nie ouwens omdou, dit kom van twee kanten af. Die feit dat die kalf groter is en die feit dat die maasepel is kleiner is. Dit het ek in die praktijk gesien. En ja. dan uh, ja, ja. Raak, raak in die eindproduk Ek denk, dat is net plek vir die goed in terminale kruise, wat nie een vreselike groot bedrijf in Zuid-Afrika is nie. En van die ander ding wat my vreselik plaak, sal graag hoor wat jy daar oortink, wat, wat betreft prestatie toetsen, net soos wat mens met hybrid weger, was er kracht nie dieren kan prestatie toets vergelijk tegen syver dieren nie. Want dit word nie noodwendig oorgedra, die voordele op produksie word nie oorgedra na die geslacht toe. 
sê my logika vir my, my selle met, uh, uh, met double muslin carriers. Kijk, die dubbel geen draas is makkelijk, enig iemand kan dit sê. Die geaffecteerde dieren, die, die, die probleem dieren is die, die draas. En hulle het ook verschillende mate ja. van expressie, nie? Van, van baie plat af na baie mooi bespeer. Hmm. Ja, ja. En verskillende rasse, soos hy gewaas het. Ja. Yes. En my ervaring by my is, hulle punt so het, op hulle punt hulle so 10% na 15% beter dan normale dieren gemiddeld. Hmm. En hulle daar enkel geen draas het, het beter productie nie, wat groei betref, meeste van die tyd. Het hulle, hmm. uh, die, die geaffecteerde dieren het baie swak groei en, en my sien dit makkelijk. Maar die dieren wat draas is, uh, word geselecteer, hulle presteer baie goed en dan val hulle uit later met baie swak in die productie en melk en uh, baie interessante dinges, ja. ek vat nou die tijd, baie interessante dinges, ek die minibologie by my gehad, toe het my gesê, ek moet gaan teruggaan op my records, die colors wat hou aftrek van double muslin, om maar die kop en die tong so geswel is, hoeveel oorleef. En ek, mm. het, ek, ek het gewonder op ja, een vraag so ja. vraag, toe gaan kyk ek. Mm. By ons waar al baie siektes en kou is en, en pla is, 50% van die dieren word nooit volwassen dieren. Net omdat mm-hmm. hulle nie binnen die eerste 6 gouwe ure bies kon inmelk. Jy sien al vanaan drink, dan denk jy, het is sjap. Maar sy word nie volwassen dieren. Ek moes het visies terug gaan en kyk en toe sien 50% word nooit volwassen dieren. So, daar is volgens my is daar geen, geen oordeel wat betref my hoestet en draas. Ja, ek het het ook hier weer gesê, en dat is die kalf gebore word met die tong wat uithang, dan is het gewoonlijke teken van, van draar, of van dubbel bespeer het. So. Ja, ja. It, just, just quickly what Pukki says, uh, he, he concurs with, with what he let us said, um, one of the biggest problems are these difficult carvings, and then they, they, they get cholestro- colostrum uh, in, in in time, and uh, the survival rate of those calves are usually less than 50%. So, so there's, that, that's, that's really one, one of the issues. Uh, obviously, uh, the carriers will, uh, can be good growers, but, but then they fall, fall down again on the fertility uh, and maybe even the longevity side. So, so um, in my mind, uh, in, in the extensive type of uh, conditions that we farm in South Africa, there's possibly no, no real benefit of, of uh, going the European way. Uh, with this, with this, uh, these genes. Um, who was the other guy? Uh, Albi. 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 Yeah. I'll say, oh, thank you. Albi is here now. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. I'll say, thank you. I had just a question. I would like to know what is the policy for um, for the race now? Uh, in genootskappe, sonder om nou die rases name toe, of te, die, 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 die rase te noem, sal ek wil weet, die me, weet wat, 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 wat doen die rase? Is daar, neem hulle net kennis, uh, uh, is daar be, sekere beleid, wat sekere rase volg, en sê, jy weet, hulle, hulle uh, elimineer die dieren totaal, of, jy weet, um, ek sal net graag wil weet, wat gebeur in Stafrika met verskillende rase oor die algemeen? Jy weet, neem hulle maar net kennis, of doen die meeste raas, rase actually iets daaran, of, of so, dit is my eindelijk my vraag. Um, okay, uh, all this question was, was uh, what, what, yeah, yeah, uh, Ilya, just repeat the question quickly, yeah. Okay, you can uh, go ahead. So, uh, the, the question, the question, yeah, yeah, the question was, what are the breed societies, or the, the breeders of specific, of different breeds doing about this? So that's a question. That's a very difficult question, I'll be. Uh, so or are they so actually, maybe, Ilian, I don't know if you have... Are they actually doing something? Uh, 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 I, I think we're in a stage now, uh, Ilian, if you can let me answer that. I think we're in a stage okay. now, Obi, that we, 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 we get these results back, uh, you know, that the, the, like the ones that Ilian has now presented. Because we were, we were not very sure about the carriers. Obviously, the... The real double muscled animals, we, you know exactly what's happening. You know, there's a lot of literature about that. But I think the carriers were, were, the, were the problems. And, and now it seems as if some of the, or, or in some breeds at least, uh, in, uh, you know, there's a detrimental effect on, on, on fertility and longevity and milk on, in the carriers. And so at this stage, I think we, we in an exploratory phase of, 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 of making decisions. Um, and obviously, it will be from breed to breed. So, 
Uh, I think in, in most cases, uh, you know, we uh, animals were tested, uh, those will be indicated on, on, on sales catalogs, at least, so that the buyer uh, knows what, what, what's going on, uh, you know, in terms of, 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 the, of the specific animal. Ilyana, I don't know if you want to elaborate on you know, that, but they I think are at this stage, that are... we don't have firm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there are breeds that do have a policy or guidelines for the breeders. Um, and the uh, Aubrey societies that take note of this, this dull muscling is widespread uh, in many breeds. So um, uh, I think that if you, if you have it, you should um, quickly try and, and um, breed it out uh, before it gets too high in your breed. Because once you have a high, um, a number of carriers, it's very difficult because you can't get rid of all the carriers at one stage. But if you only have a few, um, you can already start eliminating them if you know about the problem and if you test them. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, uh, I see Yusuf's hand again. Yusuf, are you, do you still want to ask a question or uh, I see you've also written something in the, in the, uh, in the, what do you call it? This the chat box. But you can ask the question. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Ami. Excuse me, Yamriela. The volgende vraag wat ek wil vraag en hopelijk is die laatste vraag. Sê vir my die drie type double bespiering strain. Are you very soft? I can't really hear you. Yeah, now he's asking about the three strains. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. three strains. Of, carry, uh, carry on, uh, Yusuf. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. The one which you said is uh, yeah. a, a, a more deadly or much more more uh, uh, visible and carries more weight than the others. You also mentioned that some of these double muscling traits are visible and some are not. Is that uh, one which you've mentioned that is much more severe also? not visible or possibly also not visible and you wouldn't know until you test? Did, did you hear that, Ileana? He, he was asking about the three strains. Uh, would, would, would there be some more visible uh, as carriers or, or not necessarily? I think uh, maybe just one answer, Yusuf. Uh, you know, the, 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 those graphs that she's shown, um, you know, on the visual assessment has shown that there's a tendency that, uh, the, the, uh, some of the carriers can be favored, uh, in, in, uh, uh, maybe unconsciously favored, uh, in, 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 in that, not, not necessarily, uh, deliberately. So there, there's a possibility that, that people might see more muscling in, in carriers in certain cases. Uh, but we've also seen that there are normal animals which are not carriers with good muscling as well. So you can select for muscling without necessarily um, favoring the, uh, the, the, the carriers. But I think in terms of the most detrimental ones, uh, I mean, those, those examples of the cows and the calves, you, you can't see it in the cow. You couldn't see it in the cow, but, but, the, but the, she was a carrier and obviously the sire was also a carrier and, and it just comes out, you, you, you physically can't see it in the, in, in the offspring. And that's the, the, the problem with the, with the, with the, with the hidden, uh, hidden uh, um, uh, uh, gene. Pukkie, uh, ek sien jou hand is weer op, so jy is welkom. Of is dit nog van die vorige keer, maar jy is welkom om weer te praat, is reg. Dankie dok, jy heb jy net twee vinnig gevraag. Ek wil net weet wat betreft die prestatie toets en gaan die hier ideaal nie wees dan om hierdie diere te skuif van die skoon diere oor hy geweldige voordeel wat hy het van al die draars op produksie, direct. En dan die ander vraag wat ek wil hee, die sogenaamde silent carrier, soos die NT414 waarvan, waarvan heel wat ouwens het. Ek hoor nou het laat die ouwens sê, hulle gaan nou voluit met die beste volle, omdat om, 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 om visueel so belangrik is vir koopers. Heel, hulle gaan nou voluit met die dieren deel, die sogenaamde silent. Is hier nie een situasie dat ons nou voor en toe vijf jaar met verdere studies gaan hoor, hoe hulle, hulle is ook negatief nie, of is hulle definitief nie negatief nie? Hulle is negatief nie. Praat, praat, praat nou, ja, praat jy spesifiek van die wat nou geen effect het nie, praat jy spesifiek van hulle. 
Um, yeah, I brought my phone. Yes, I, I, I yeah. yeah, okay. So, so the question was the, the, the so called green ones <laughs> that Ilena has shown us. Um, is it okay to carry on? Uh, won't we end up in a few years to say, look, we shouldn't have done it? Uh, it's, it's, it's causing a lot of harm. Uh, I don't know, but but Ilena, maybe you can you can answer that. Um, I don't know. You don't get anything about that anywhere in the in the literature. And as I said, we have a student now that's looking if there's any correlation or anything to do with those green ones. Uh, and that's why we're giving it back to the breeders so that if something pops up, um, you do have the records on your on your calves. The, they say uh, those mutations are in the silent part of the, or the inactive part of the gene. Or um, it makes a change in the myostatin, but it doesn't affect the protein. So I don't know. Um, that's one of the things that uh, we will keep on looking for. Um, okay, then there's a there's a question in the chat box, uh, Elena, from uh, Chris Nell. Um, what that's asked is: there, Are there any breeds that's 100% uh, clean? Call it clean, if you like, <laughs> of of this gene. <laughs> I've seen photographs of breeds with, with double muscle that you wouldn't have thought should be. If you upgrade, then you can inadvertently, I think, bring it in. So um, I, I know it's very widespread. So. Yeah, I, I wanted to say tongue in cheek. Now with COVID, you you all of a sudden realize what mutations do. Um, you oh. could have a you could. Who, who says within five or ten years you could have new new mutations? Uh, hopefully not, but it's 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 possible. That's the way uh, gene actions sometimes work, especially in certain regions on the chromosome. You could have this uh, high high frequency of mutations. So it's it's and hopefully it will not happen. Uh, it uh, I mean it's like the horn and, and pole gene. The pole gene is also a mutation from the original horn gene. Uh, cattle used to all have horns sometimes some million years back. Yeah. Okay, uh, are, they, are there any more? Uh, uh, Sureta, you must assist me if the, there are more hands up. Uh, Sureta or Herman, um, uh, I, I can't see more hands up uh, for questions. Um, if that's the case, uh, we can, yes, we can continue. Uh, Pukki? Yes, welcome Pukki. Yes, not to be like as as you will eat severe. Ja, op my reg as ek verkeerd is die, soos ek het verstaan, is dit een enkel geen en ek hoor mense sê nou, weet, mense kan het bestuur en selectief daarmee, maar ek verstaan nie mooi, hoe kan ek ou met enkel geen selectief heel Hy het of hy het nie, jy kan nie, jy kan nie bykie daarvan vat en jy gaan bykie bespie. Ja, jy is 100% reg. Um, uh, he wanted to know if it's a single gene, how can you manage it? You either have it or you haven't it. Uh, the problem comes if you now um, suddenly realize that most of your animals do have it. You know, if you have a double muscle calf being born, it means there's roughly four carriers, cows in your, in your herd already. And um, if that's the case, you uh, need to get the frequency down by using normal, making sure that you use normal bulls um, to bring the frequency down. So um, the ideal will be to just get rid of all the carriers, but it's not always possible. Uh, and that's, that's the problem. But at least now. Yeah, Elena, you're off the air for a while. Sorry, Elena, I think a signal is... Elena, you're back. No. She's, uh, she's off. I, I, I think, Pukki, the other question was about the uh, performance of those animals. I think uh, it sometimes helps if you, if, you, if, if you have that in performance testing to actually uh, be a little bit more cautious that those uh, top performers might be carriers. Uh, you know, it, we, we've seen that with other detrimental genes uh, for fertility, for example, in dairy cattle, uh, where they the, the bulls with very poor breeding values for fertility in dairy cattle, they all of a sudden found some 
some variants in single gene variants um, carriers uh, or, or, or maybe a, a homozygous you know with, with both uh, uh, the the um, the genes uh, or the the mutations and and uh, so sometimes with your performance testing you you can you can also look into why this happens and I see and I think we see it with the mold breeding values uh, being um, negatively influenced uh, all of a sudden the mold breeding values drop uh, uh, for some animals and then they were carriers so as soon as their daughters came uh, started uh, winning their calves. Uh, we realized that uh, maybe those were actually carrier bulls, um, you know, in the in the in the population. I think there's Elena, are you back? Uh, you just muted at the moment. I'm getting messages that my internet is unstable. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, there's a question: Which uh, beef cattle breeds are less uh, negatively influenced by the NT uh, gene? Uh, you know, I don't know if you want to answer that one. Uh, we're all very sensitive about the breeds. Uh, you know, we have had so many, um, many uh, hidings in the past. If we if we mention breeds, so uh, uh, obviously when one talks to a, a specific breed society, it's a different story. But when it's an open um, discussion, then we are a bit cautioned. Uh, you know, I not think to, you. I think yeah. you get animals in all breeds that are uh, less affected or more affected. So um, uh, you must just look in your breed for the ones that are that are less um, affected. If you have to, if you're in the situation that you have to select on the carriers or not. Yeah. Okay. Is it is it fine if we can uh, conclude this? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your for your uh, for your attendance. Uh, this is recorded, so we will we'll also make this available um, uh, on Studbook's uh, YouTube channel for those of you who would like to revisit this. I don't know if anybody that attended wanted to revisit this, but uh, you're welcome to do this. Or uh, or uh, for those who that we couldn't attend, you can you can maybe just tell your fellow, fellow breeders about this and and give them a, a, a chance to to maybe also follow Elena's presentation and and the discussions afterwards. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised. Uh, I, I don't know, Surieta, at some stage we were I think over seventy attendants. Uh, we were worried about our Zoom license that can only take a hundred. Uh, at, at uh, concurrent, uh, but we at least kept uh, just under the 100. Uh, so again, uh, many thanks, Ileana, for your presentation and Surieta and Herman for your um, for, for it, uh, holding the candle and, and, and uh, in the background and, and allowing people in uh, on this uh, on these talks. So uh, all of the best. Uh, yeah, 74, Ileana says, was we were at the peak. Uh, so uh, have a good evening and or a good day if you're in uh, in uh, Argentina. Uh, enjoy your day. And uh, I, I also saw Yochi on from Namibia. I don't know if there were other Namibians on. So uh, that was also uh, a uh, uh, good to have you guys on on board as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lorena. Uh, good. Thank you, okay. everybody. All right. Have a okay. good day, evening. All right. Bye bye. Goodbye.